This episode is brought to you by Paraswap, the leading aggregator to find best prices across various DEXs. You'll hear more about them later in the show. We want to be the Web3 onboarding portal for the next millions of users to Web3 in Africa through bringing play to earn and introducing this concept to Africa. All right, guys, I'm super excited for this episode of Empire. We got Santi here, per usual. We got James Zhang, the co-founder of Jombo. Uh, for those who don't know Jombo, you will know Jombo very soon. Uh, here's a quick overview. What WeChat did in China, Jombo is going to do in Africa. Jombo's goal is to become the Web3 super app of Africa. We've got their co-founder on the show today. Uh, got some big news that I think he's going to leak, leak a little alpha on the show today. So, James, welcome to Empire, my friend. Oh, thank you for having me, guys. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Santiago. Um, big fan of the show. Uh, really happy to jam with you guys. You know, happy to share a lot with all the viewers. You know, there's a lot of information. I think because we've been stealth for the last two, three months, we haven't shared at all. And I sort of waited for this episode to really um, share all the news, really tell everyone what we're about and really shed some light on Africa and Web3 and uh, what's going on over there and what we're trying to accomplish. Amazing. Amazing. We're excited. So, I mean, I think let's go there. Let's go to Africa before we get into the specifics of Jumbo, right? I, I kind of want you to just frame, uh, give us some context here, right? Because Santi and I, like the show has become almost like you talk a lot about companies that are in either Europe or specifically London or maybe San Francisco or New York. Um, a couple episodes talking about China and, you know, in, in Asia, but we haven't actually talked too much about Africa. So can you just give us some context, zoom out, what is like the state of crypto in Africa today? And like, why have you guys chosen to focus there? Yeah, hundred um, percent. You know, lucky enough this past four years, you know, so as an investor in crypto, I was always, I always sort of known as the Africa emerging markets guy. So I really had a lot of good deal flow, you know, into the area, a lot of great founders, et cetera. The, the problem was founding uh, both the Africa and crypto native team. Which honestly is a prerequisite when you're dealing with Africa, because it's sort of like Southeast Asia 30, uh, 30 years ago. So I think most of what I'm seeing come out of Africa, and don't get me wrong, they're amazing teams, is dealing with remittance, money flow, um, sort of DeFi yields to traditional banking in Africa. And uh, the most narrative is banking the unbanked. So sort of what we're seeing, uh, well, I'm seeing in Africa is a lot of people think about Africa as charity. They're not thinking about in a constructive way of how we can build in Africa, what to do. I uh, know I'm talking about most of the retail market and also honestly, uh, some of the investors I'm speaking with things of Africa as a charity project that how we can sort of accomplish something there as something that's so uh, emerging of a market. So the whole banking, the unbanked narrative, you know, I get it, you know, 1.5 billion people, um, you know, the, it's a huge market to, to bank, you know, that are unbanked. The problem is, is Africa really is 1% super rich and 99% the same. There is no middle class. So when there's not really a lot to be banked with the lowest GDP concentrated people in the world, you know, I really don't see as much of a fast strategy of helping acquire users and helping them reach financial freedom and giving back to them through just banking them. Because we want to be the Web3 onboarding portal for the next millions of users to Web3 in Africa through bringing play to earn and introducing this concept to Africa. It's interesting you bring up uh, remittances. Like when I, when, last night I was looking at just all the, a lot of like the FinTech projects that are getting uh, funded in Africa. It seems like 90% of these projects right now revolve around payment solutions or remittances. Like every single one is like payment solutions or remittances. Mm -hmm. Very few projects offer kind of solutions around investment opportunities for what would I would say like your average person in Africa is so is that kind of the thesis here is that like you're not as much focused on you're not another company launching payment solutions remittances you're trying to increase the GDP and increase the wealth of Africa is that am I on the right track here no uh, you're exactly right Jason I think it's not a knock on anyone that's building in Africa I think it's incredible builders anytime you, you're building in Africa is heavy operations you're not just dealing with data points you're dealing with people and if you hit a certain scale doing anything in Africa, any country, because um, it's really not just one large continent, you know, not just Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and the rest of it is small distributed regions that have their own cultural and linguistic differences. So anytime you hit scale in any of these regions, you have to have a lot of political backing or, you know, something. Otherwise, you're going to see a lot of different licenses come your way, a lot of different frictions. So for what we set out to do, you know, that I feel like is a bit different from what currently is in Africa is that we feel like if you set out dealing with money flow, you're messing with the government. You're you're dealing with a lot of things that um, have constant changes, and there's a lot of friction. So 
Um, we will partner with a lot of, you know, the guys that are doing amazing things in Africa from fiat to crypto on ramps for giving a lot more crypto access and educating the population. Um, but we will sort of partner with them in those ways. And our, cause our ultimate goal is to bring the web three applications to help the African make money. For example, in play to earn, you know, there is no such concept as play to earn in Africa at the moment. You know, you take the same, which is something that, you know, really helped me start off and take the dive into doing Jumbo because it's really not a company for my co-founder, you know, Alice, my sister and I, who grew up in Congo and Central Africa. Um, it's not, you know, something that's just a company. It's really a mission. You know, you look at sort of how long we are invest in everything is five to 10 year project and mission. So for what we're trying to do, you know, we look at the same value proposition. You look at Southeast Asia, low GDP great mobile and 4G penetration. And we look at Africa where we grew up, you know, and where we spend most of our time investing. And it's just true by order of magnitude. It's the lowest GDP. It's the best, it's not the best, but one of the best 4G pen and mobile penetrations in emerging markets. I think there's over 600 million uh, mobile, you know, phone users, which is even more than the US and Europe. Um, so, and 4G is great penetration. It's just that prices have never gone down in the last 10 years because it's monopolized by a, a handful of telcos. And those telcos can monopolize the 4G in Africa because they're the ones that built that infrastructure. So for us, you know, what we're really trying to do, you know, bringing play to earn Africa and helping the average user make money is that we have to build the infrastructure, which inclu uh, includes a lot of education, and a lot of onboarding and customer facing in Africa. So like the average, I think Southeast Asian, you know, salary, well, let's say Philippines, I think it's between two to 300 US dollars. And playing Axie Infinity, you know, today, uh, current SLP prices, obviously, you know, we're in a small sort of market cycle, might be around 50 to 70 US dollars, you know, in a good month, depending on how good you do in arena. In Africa right now, I'd say the average salary, you know, in most places is around 30 to 80 US dollars. And that's with a population of 30 to 40% uh, unemployed. So, you know, the average um, African family is around 15 people with three people working. Those three people pay what you call the African debt. They have to support the rest of their families, you know, working day in, day out, you know, 100 hour work weeks, et cetera. And a lot of that is manual labor. Um, so for what we are trying to accomplish is that, you know, those other 12 people in the family now, you know, see someone just graduated from university, someone, you know, is working in the city, you know, trying to find their way. Now they can literally take their phone that they're using every day anyways to play this game, you know, et cetera, and support their family and they'll help out. So that's what I guess where we start off different, you know, thesis basis. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, value proposition? When I think of your edge, it sounds like you have a lot of relationships with some of the Web2 providers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the narrative in crypto has been, let's blow up Wall Street, let's blow up Web2. We're going to build a better version of Web3. But what you're saying is actually different, which is, no, let's actually leverage all of this fabric that exists. It's a patchwork, nonetheless, but partner with local players as on-ramp mechanisms. Well, I'm curious uh, to get your perspective on what are the conversations with some of these local players look like? And, and what, what are they seeing to be convinced? Because we talk about regulation a lot in crypto and why governments and existing incumbents might not really want to work with c crypto companies. But what I'm hearing here is actually quite different and refreshing, which is it sounds like they're interested. So, so walk us through what kind of these discussions and collaborations look like. So for what we see in how to leverage uh, Web2 connections is it's not as so much as leveraging as to if you didn't grow up in Africa and have a presence, you know, because my family's been in Africa for three generations, you know, and we've invested in the local infrastructure and, you know, a lot of local web too for the past few decades, that sort of, the, that trust has been built. Otherwise, no matter, you know, what I try to do, you know, even if I grew up in Africa, et cetera, have tried to do business there, you know, et cetera, it's not really going to work out because trust is such a um, important thing in Africa in such an inorganic top down, you know, bottleneck growth sort of area. So um, for us, what we're seeing, you know, right now, regulation wise, um, anything you touch with money, you know, uh, you need a lot of licenses, fiat to crypto, et cetera. You know, there's amazing companies in Africa. You know, Nigeria, for example, Patricia, one of the, you know, the largest crypto fiat uh, on ramp exchanges, you know, had a huge hit to their volume just because the Nigerian government decided to shut down banking for them. And that story, you know, can be replicated into any country. I can give you a different name. Um, so essentially, if you try to onboard users and do that, it's, it's really tough. So sort of the approach that we've taken is, We've gone to all of our business partners and a lot of our investors and a lot of sort of amazing companies in Africa that have been around for decades and doing great business there to sort of leverage them and work with them to sort of introduce Web3 because they also understand that this, what's currently happening with like a two to 300 US dollar user acquisition cost per African, you know, um, user is just not, it's not worth it right now. It doesn't make sense on a business perspective because 
over, I'd say 75% of the average Asian Africa right now is under 35 year old, years old, between 19 and 35. But the GDP is just so low that they can't make money on that two or 300 user acquisition cost. So they understand that through Web3, you can you know tokenize a lot of the advertising budget. You can fractionally incentivize every user. So that's sort of something that uh, the value proposition was very simple on the get-go when you communicate with them. Um, the problem is as well, the speed. Um, anytime you deal with Web2, which is a lot of these tech companies that are currently in Africa, and Web1, which is, you know, data providers, the telcos, it's going to take a long time to onboard. So, yeah, certainly. Uh, I think uh, on, on this point, Jason, before we kind of move on, I, I'm curious, to, just from a telco perspective, what you're saying is their current customer acquisition cost is is 30, you know, it's it's quite high relative to kind of the lifetime value of this customer, even though it's young and, you know, you see a path, but but the payback is, is kind of multiple years, assuming the retention is there. You come in and you say, listen, we're just going to help you acquire these customers because because they're still going to use your their smartphone to play a game, a Web3 game. That's going to just increase like business for them. It's going to lower the customer acquisition cost because you're either incentivizing on the back end with a token that, you know, kind of like subsidizes this cost. The incentives are really strong. So the user is just going to make it more compelling for telecom A. Uh, versus telecom B in a particular country, and and they love that, and they and they want to partner with Jumbo on this basis. Is that kind of like the gist of it? Yes and no, because on that part, maybe I wasn't clear. The telco side, we're actually not helping them um, acquire as many users. When I said acquire users and lowering the user ever acquisition costs, it's for the Web two companies, the fastest growing Web two apps in Africa. So those are the guys that will work with us. You know, I can't really name too many yeah. names right now that because we haven't announced any partnerships, um, mm -hmm. but. Uh, literally the fastest growing web two apps in Africa, they have the 200, 300 US dollar user acquisition cost. So we're sort of working with them on that part. Regarding the telcos though, maybe I can take it just a few minutes to speak on that part. Um, yeah, um, for telcos it's super important because the handful of telcos like Orange MTN, Safaricom, Vodacom, that sort of like monopolize Africa. When you go telco to telco, like MTN to MTN, you know, Vodacom to Vodacom, it's like uh, maybe 30 cents a minute, you know, uh, phone fees. But then when you go from like MTN to Safaricom, that might be like, uh, $1 or $3 of cost. So it's actually a, a very interesting thing. It's a show and sign of wealth in Africa when you have like three or four mobile phones. Uh, you might have a Techno, which is the, you know, the, the top phone. And then you might have an Oppo Vivo. They're all between 50 to 200 US dollars. You might have a Nokia. You know, when I grew up, I had like two, three phones. You know, my dad, you know, between every telephone line had like six phones because in business in Africa, you have to have one for every phone. You should have give your phone number to each person. It's like MTN, you know, James phone number. Safaricom, James phone number. It's like a super interesting thing. And then data is like honestly a currency in itself in this area. Like in Congo, Congo is like, you know, it literally cent central Africa, 120 mil population, largest Francophone speaking country in the world, larger than France. You know, where I grew up, the capital city, Kinshasa. There's about 10 million people. Literally, you know, like you might be, you know, on the, the boulevard. You get stopped at a red light by like two police officers, you know, because I, I get it. If they don't do that, you know, occasionally, you know, they might not have money to feed their family. So like they will sort of haggle you down, you know, make you wait like, you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes. And then, you know, it's just sort of a long process. So how you get that going is you don't even give money to bribe them. You give them a prepaid card with phone credits inside. So there will be like, a, you know, a carton, a cartridge with phone credits in my car. And then you take like a $10, like. Vodacom carrier plan to them and they're like, okay, okay, you can go. Like, thank you. So that's like a basic necessity uh, for Africans. Um, well, at least in Congo, how I grew up 16 years there. It's crazy just as an aside that, uh, you know, we talk about like, I think Congo is the longest standing civil war in, in the history of the world uh, or or, some, or close to that. And it, and it yes, obviously sir. claims a lot of lives each year and no one actually has heard of this. And it, to me, it I think it's true. And, and to me, it's um, shocking that the level of, of understanding of Africa, you know, most people just think about Africa, as you said, as just one category, but it is very, very different. Uh, each country is drastically different, Northern Africa, Southern Africa, you know, in different pockets, right? And and, and I think it, it, there's a lot of ignorance as, as it relates to um, the continent. Um, I think I've read a book recently, it was China is just aggressively moving into, and probably the country that is investing the most amount to build out infrastructure um, across Africa to kind of secure natural resources. Uh, so what do you, um, was that, I mean, you're also, which is fine. You're also, I think from Chinese background. And so, um, is there a big push? I'm curious, uh, traditional, like Chinese companies, are they thinking about crypto? Um, or are they just not really focused on, on any of this? 
No, hundred percent. You know, um, just to clarify for everyone, ethnically I am uh, Asian. You know, I'm Chinese, but my family's been in uh, Congo. You know, in Africa for three generations. I grew up there. But sort of clarify. But it's like you said, um, Chinese companies have made the largest push. I think out of anyone to go into Africa. You look at the sort of Web two giants that have come up in Africa in the last decade. Transient number one. You know, uh, they sell over a hundred million phones. You know, last year. Uh, in Africa, you know, they have like four, you know, different ones like uh, Techno, et cetera, et cetera, fifty dollars to two hundred dollars. You got Oppo, Vivo. I think they have a ten percent, you know, market penetration. Um, you got TikTok, um, one of the fastest growing apps in Africa. Uh, Boomplay, you know, the Spotify of Africa. Their edge over Apple Music and Spotify, in my mind, is they've signed almost all the African IP, um, et cetera, et cetera. For example, I grew up like listening to Fali Pupa in Congo. Sign him, like different things like that. So you look at it all, most of the unicorns, like over 80% are Chinese going to Africa. I think a lot of reason is because number one, the companies are going to Africa. Well, I think definitely they're not really thinking about crypto because of two fronts. The first is that they can't do it. Like if ByteDance, you know, the parent company of TikTok, $500 billion market cap company, um, I, there's no way they can release a token or do anything, you know, like that in Africa. You know, and second, I think, you know, regulatory wise in China, um, crypto is you know, not the most uh, frontward facing. Because that's not the reason they're going to Africa for. The reason they're going to Africa is they're making a strong bet, I think, in a market that they see as the most emerging economy for the next 10 plus years. They're not making money right now, but I think it's laying the groundwork. What is what does crypto penetration look like um, today in a place like, uh, you know, Congo, DRC? Like, um, what is the existing infrastructure? Like you talked, there are some players already in the region, but I am curious if you just give us a quick, like, rundown of, 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 of you know, how receptives um are people in uh, certainly places like nigeria i think have one of the highest like flows of just remittances uh of, of bitcoin volume and stuff like that but what is it just kind of like across the continent if you just give us a, a quick rundown of, of what are the killer applications if any that people are using right now and using kind of crypto rails yeah um i'd say centralized exchanges are tough you look at the um the patricias you look at the bit pesos um Valor, you know, et cetera. There's uh they've been around. I'd say let's start with Patricia or BitPesa. They've been around since like 2013, 14. Fiat crypto on ramps, Ugandan shillings, Nigerian Niger, you know, Congolese francs. Um, still it's a lot of the government um risk. Like uh, I invested in a crypto exchange in Zimbabwe in 2018. And then overnight, you know, that investment was gone, even though their transactional volume was looking amazing because uh, they shut down the central bank, you know, banking for them, and then they went to South Africa, didn't work out. So I'd say uh, centralized exchanges is tough, which goes back to why peer to peer, I think, is really going to might this year, next year. I don't know, but I think that will really revolutionize a lot of the payments that goes around in Africa, peer to peer transactions. Right now, three out of the top 10 countries in the world for peer to peer transactions based on, I think, PAX for local Bitcoins is uh, African countries. Number two, like you said, Nigeria. Um, number one is U.S., obviously. Number eight is Niger- uh, Kenya and number 10 is South Africa. So I think there's huge uh, potential and everyone can see that, right? If no matter your Web2, Web3 company, you see the level of transactional volume. You look at, you know, all the demographic, the age group, you know, 19, 35 years old. You look at mobile penetration, 4G penetration. It's something that you can't sort of solve for five years ago because, you know, all these things aren't set in place yet. The infrastructure isn't there. But now the infrastructure is there. The education level is catching up. Uh, James, I'm looking at this chart on useful tulips of just order book trading volumes for Africa on local Bitcoins and Paxful. And you're right, it's exploding, right? Like Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana is doing well as well. South Africa, like really, really large P2P volumes. But on the other hand, there's this report that Chainalysis put out. Africa has received $105.6 billion worth of crypto between July and uh, 2020 and July 2021, which is makes it the smallest uh, crypto region of any you know major region in the world. And that kind of is a bit of like a narrative violation to, I think what we talk about in the U S a lot, which is like, okay, crypto is going to like bank the unbanked. There's that, these, you know, there's that kind of like nice one liner. Right. So I guess like, I I want to dig a little deeper. Like why hasn't everything that you're saying is like, there's not that much financial infrastructure and all that, you know, civil war and all that kind of stuff. It seems to me as you know, kind of this dumb outsider that crypto would, would absolutely take off. And it'd be a no brainer for folks in Africa or in the Congo to use Bitcoin and, and ETH and things like that. So why hasn't it taken off? Why is it still the smallest crypto region of anywhere in the world? Uh, yeah, I, I think I've seen that report and I'll chain analysis as well. Um, you know, honestly, I'd say short answer, low GDP in education. Um, the longer, you know, answer would be, you know, to 
sort of as to the point of what, you know, how YGG solved a lot of Southeast Asia's problems in the Philippines, especially was their whole, why they paid you know, 20% to all of their community managers is because they help you train on how to play Axie Infinity, win arena games and make, you know, two or 12 SLPs. But most important is when you want to cash out at the end of those two weeks, they teach you what exchange to go to, whether that be Binance trading pairs in the local currency, whether that to, you know, the money teller system, but they navigate you of how to onboard onto MetaMask or other wallets and then how to do that. So education, you know, Philippines was super key. And like I said, Africa is like Philippines 30 years ago. So there, that education has not been done by I think a lot of crypto companies um, at the moment. So if you are an average like 21 year old in Lagos, which is you know well, a first year city in Africa, and you don't even know how to set up a crypto wallet in your in your Android phone, um, and your incentive to do so would be to help you save money or help you transfer money or help you to gain I don't care like a 15 50 percent um, annualized yield, you're not you don't have such a strong incentive to do anything about that because it's so far away from you. You're thinking about your basic necessities of food, medicine, and airtime like data. Um, so honestly, I think. In order to educate someone, you have to make them really want to be educated. And the reason, the way to want someone to be educated is to incentivize them enough. So if you can incentivize them that if they can set up a crypto wallet or understand how to, you know, understand not even like what Web3 is. Um, I think a lot of our BD on the ground still, you know, don't know obviously 100% what Web3 is, but at least, you know, the infrastructure for how to educate someone into it and take the red pill is, you know, show them, show them the money. Like you play to earn, you can make four X of your salary. You can go from unemployed to employed, making more than your family members. You be, they become an ambassador for ourselves because our ultimate goal is to onboard as many Web3 users as possible um, and to help them do what they always done, except make money doing so. So I want to I want to actually get deep, a little deeper into Jumbo in a second. But so Santi, a couple of weeks ago, he's like telling me about you guys. He's like, I'm so excited about this company, Jumbo. I invested. I'm really, really excited. Um, we can talk about the investment side of things as well. And I sat down to kind of try to dig into the thesis, right? I was like, let me try to understand why Santiago is so excited. And I kind of bucketed, the first bucket was like societal. I was like, oh, there's a big societal trend that they're riding here. Like 75% of Africans are, you know, less than, are younger than 35 years old. 15 of the world's fastest growing cities are in the U.S. Um, you know, 60% of Africans are under the age of 25. I was like, all right, this is a societal and cultural trend that they're riding. And I was like, no, actually... Maybe it's like a monetary trend, right? When you look at inflation, like you've got Sudan's like 200%, Zimbabwe 100%, South Sudan 40%, Angola 20%, Libya 20%. I was like, okay, this is a monetary thing that they're actually trying to fix. And then I was like, no, this is actually a financial infrastructure thing, right? You, I, I don't remember the actual stats that you mentioned, but it was something about smartphone adoption. There's like 650 million users in Africa, uh, 500 unique uh, 500 million unique mobile subscribers in sub-Saharan Africa. So I was like, okay, this is actually a financial infrastructure play. And so I'm just curious how you view Jumbo, and maybe it changes as you guys go to market and maybe it changes over the years, but is this more of a, like a monetary play? Uh, is this more of a, like a societal, cultural entertainment play? Or is this more of like a financial infrastructure play? This is, you know, as, as, you know, as crazy as it sounds, you know, I look Asian, you know, ethnically I'm Chinese, but Africa is my home. You know, that's, you know, I'm born and raised and et cetera. So um, anytime, you know, Alice and I, my sister and I have always known that, you know, we will eventually spend probably most of our, you know, youth um, in the next premiership that we do on Africa, but we've never done so. Like I said, in the last five, you know, 10 years, when we started becoming serial entrepreneurs, because I don't think the infrastructure was ready and maybe we weren't ready at the same time. So I think for us, when we started Jumbo a few months ago, we really, you know, had an understanding this is a five to 10 year mission. Like I said, it's, it's a, a stress mission. It's not a project. We're putting everything on the line here. We're putting our family's reputation in Africa of three generations because we're using all of our relationships in Africa, everyone that we can put forward. You know, currently, you know, Africa time zone with us. Uh, where I'm not currently in Africa is like crazy. So we're, we've slept like on average, like four or five hours a day for the past three months, you know, calling between closing our rounds, you know, um, and uh, operation wise with our offices in Africa. Um, so for Alice and I, honestly doing this project, you know, happy to dive deeper into what Jumbo, you know, each product is going to be in the roadmap and what we've done in Q1. But essentially, I think that's uh, sort of what we're about, you know, uh, because Africa is our home. Yeah, why, why don't we move in that direction, um, James? And, um, you know, tell us a little bit about what you've done, which when I first met you, I heard the pitch, which is similar to what you just described. And to me, it was sort of was like, a, it, it really hit me. It's like, I don't have much exposure to Africa. And it makes a lot of sense demographically, 
you know, the region is obviously challenging because it's very localized, but still, I mean, it, it sort of, I was happy to have met you because I do think that you guys have an edge. You have relationships with Web2 players. You understand from a go-to-market standpoint, you have a deep appreciation for how each region is different. Um, and then you have a lot of boots on the ground. Um, and it's impressive because you, I think of you know a lot of crypto companies, there's a lot of focus on the tech, a lot of focus on the idea and the token design, but not a lot of like actual, you know what I mean? Like, boots on the ground and scaling um you know and, and you guys have done something pretty interesting so walk us through kind of what you what you've done and how you, when we think about this web3 super app let's call it that um you know walk us through kind of different components of what you're trying to build and, and have built already um i see the last few months like i said you know some high level statistics is opening the offices in africa we've opened 14 offices across sub-saharan africa uh, we have over 30 you know on the ground operation team um, et cetera. But um, I think most importantly is that there's three main components to our um, app that we foresee. The first one is the data component. Like I, I couldn't stress enough how important data is. Um, so data can be bought, you know, in various forms in Africa right now, uh, whether that be through an application or through prepaid cards. We're most importantly, more prevalent is prepaid cards because the average budget for average Africans is probably 50 cents to a dollar every day for a prepaid card, um, you know, on a good day. So for us, you know, we're, we're trying to partner uh, with the largest telcos in Africa to sort of bring out um, that relationship where we become a wholesale distributor and can get data at an over 50% discount. And then we can provide it to the local African by doubling their airtime. So now we can provide to them at a 50% discount. So that's something I think super important. At the basis, you're doubling the airtime, which is you know doubling the amount of time that they can surf the web and go on with possibly web three, web two as it is. So you know I can't drop any names, other partnerships, et cetera, because we haven't announced, but that is something definitely in the works to come out in the very near future in the roadmap. The second part, like I said, is working with the largest social applications in Africa, you know, working with them, you know, they already have sort of the presence, the underground, the advertisement, et cetera. You know, no matter how much cash they have burned in Africa, they are still the largest players and, you know, most uh, some of the most innovative. So lucky enough, we have some relationships with some of the largest ones there. Uh, we've been in deep talks. I also cannot drop any names um, until the partnerships announced, but uh, let's just say, you know, some of the fastest growing apps and we will tokenize their advertising budget to sort of fractionalize it and provide it to the Africans so that they can continue doing what they do, whether that be watching something, listening to something, except they can actually get incentivized and earn tokens and earn data credits while doing so. Um, and the third part, you know, which is probably the most exciting for us, because I think as Tencent has proved in China, as SEA has proved in Southeast Asia, gaming is the fastest way for user acquisition in an emerging market. Um, so that's bringing play to earn in Africa and building the infrastructure for that and having that whole education process. Like, for example, right now, um, we're doing Jumbo Academy sessions. Jumbo Academy sessions, literally in each local region, is having thousands of people come out. You know, we provide food, water, et cetera, and literally help them understand what YGG and Axie have done for Philippines and Southeast Asia and why that holds true by order of magnitude for Africa and for themselves. Um, helping them understand that, that's a super easy value proposition. You know, we're not giving hour long speeches. Most of the time is taken to educate them on how to play the game and sort of getting their infrastructure and their, their mobile phone set up for that. Uh, on another part to education, you know, because I can't stress enough how important that is to educate a market of 1.5 billion people, no matter how strong of operation boots on the ground strategy you have is, um, we're partnering with a lot of universities in Africa. So for example, with the University of Kinshasa, we're partnering to launch a sort of, we could call it play to earn slash web three class, where it will be sponsored by some of you know uh, the, uh, our partners, you know our investors in Web3, some of the best founders and investors in Web3 to help sponsor these classrooms and help teach them classes on play to earn and Web3 so that they can literally pay off their tuition by playing the two or three hours of Axie Infinity or et cetera every day. Um, so I think that is something that will start off because I think a big, big misconception about Africa right now is that it's a lot of villagers, a lot of people that don't have phones, that don't understand technology. You, you go on TikTok Africa, I assure you'll be surprised by the amount of innovation, you know, and, you know, energy that you will feel on the vibes. And we're dealing with literally university students. We're dealing with people that are technologically savvy. They just have never had the chance to sort of break out of, of what they've been accustomed to their whole life. Because once you're in that sort of like spiral, you know, you're fighting for, you know, that 60% of people that can be employed with a 40% unemployment rate, you're fighting with your peers for those, you know, minimal chances. You've never been exposed to Web3. So that's sort of what we're trying to, we're trying to just give chances out here and help, you know, onboard people as best as we can through some of our, you know, partners, et cetera, that really have been as supportive on this mission with us. Empire is proud to be supported by Paraswap. Paraswap is one of the leading DEX aggregators in crypto. Let's say you're booking a flight. 
you would never go directly to an airline, right? You'd never go directly to United or Delta. You'd obviously go to Google Flights or Expedia or Kayak or Booking.com. That's what Paraswap does for DeFi. Paraswap, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see the platform. Paraswap makes swapping easier, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper by aggregating more than 80 different DEXs. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, Uniswap, Sushi, Balancer, uh, Bancor into one single interface. You can use Paraswap on ETH. Polygon, as you can see here, BSC, they recently launched Avalanche a few weeks ago, pretty exciting. If you are a trader listening to this, you are losing money by not using Paraswap. And excitingly enough, if you're a company or a platform looking to access the swapping or the yield capabilities of DEXs, you can now use Paraswap's APIs to integrate into your platform to get the full power of the DEX aggregator into your platform. So head on over to paraswap.io. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see how simple it is to use. Just plug in, let's say I wanna swap you know, 0.2 ETH, for USDT, you can see how simple it is. Just plug that in right there and it aggregates over 80 different DEXs. So head on over to Paraswap, P-A-R-A-S-W-A-P dot I-O to use the platform today. All right, let's get back to the show. When I think about building a crypto, like if, we, if you were to build like a play to earn in the States, for example, a lot of the infrastructure is already built for you. So like if you need a custodian, you go to like Coinbase Custody or Gemini or Bitco or Anchorage or something like that. If you need like a prime brokerage, you go to... I don't know, like crypto, prime, uh, like Falcon X or something like that. If you need DeFi, you can uh, plug in with like Compound or Uniswap or Aave, right? If you, right, and the list goes on and on. Like the the, fi the infrastructure, both from the financial side and just the uh, kind of technological side, is already built for you. Is that the case for you guys? Like, can you? Is it as composable in Africa? Like, if you guys want to offer yields, can you just plug in with a lot of these DeFi applications, or or if you need custody, right, of the crypto? Are you building a lot of that yourself? Are you plugging in? Like, do the custodians exist out there? Like, where are we with the with the infrastructure side of things? Um, I think that's the most beautiful part about doing a super app. You can literally part, partner with so many um, people that do so well in their niche aspects. So, for example, you said custody. You know, we're going to partner with some of the um, custodians in Africa that have proven themselves on like global, et cetera, and crypto, which has not even been around that long. Um, and these have been proven with, you know, hundreds of millions of transactional volume companies that they've already partnered with, for example, the BitPaces, the Valors, the Yellow Cards currently already in Africa. So same thing exchange wise, you know, fiat to crypto on ramps. We're going to partner with a lot of these guys as well that have proven themselves, you know, in their niche regard. Um, so I think that infrastructure, um, the only way is to pick and choose and to work with a lot of people. I think this goes back to why we have, I think, so many backers that we sort of, you know, didn't you know give too much, you know, allo into any of our rounds into because I think we can work with any of their portfolio companies that are in Africa. Like they made a lot of intros about people that I had no reach into that I might have not known. But um, that, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful part about Web3 as well. If you're, you know, if people believe in your mission and, you know, you have the same, same value principles, you can honestly, you're one degree separation from anyone. So a lot of this, we're in partnership talks at the moment to plug in for the infrastructure part. But yes, it's like you said, everything is sort of new when you come, it's all relative, right? You compare it to the U.S., to Europe, to even Southeast Asia. And there's thing, there's already super apps in like Southeast Asia. There's like, I think there's Coin98, you know, the et cetera, et cetera. You know, in Africa, there is no such thing. So uh, for, for us, we're, I think we're really going to uncharted territory here. But uh, I think the best way to do so is to, you know, like I said, uh, gather data points and have great partners to go into it with mm -hmm. you together. I think one of the very exciting things about Africa um, as I think of it, it, it really is kind of the best optimal sandbox environment because so, sometimes like I think of like oh, China, for instance, for me, it's been interesting because a lot of people initially discredited China because it was just a we're, we've been thinking that China is just a copycat nation. But then you have like really a lot of companies that leapfrog the user experience, how people think about money, like the way you use WeChat. I mean, my first when I went back to China, I was like, this is a, incredible. Uh, you know, it's a super app and you're doing everything here and it's all the functionality is sort of like, and, and then you go back to the West and like, well, finance really sucks here uh, and has been really modernized. And then that you would have looked at China as a, as a window into how finance and fintech would have developed in the U.S., right? Um, and, and, and to me, it was really interesting how you leapfrog a lot of the existing infrastructure processes in the West. And China kind of did that in a really interesting way. And a lot of people missed that boat. But I almost see Africa... And what you're doing as, as something very similar, you know, that there's, you almost sometimes don't want to have a lot of infrastructure to be, to, to be an optimal environment to leapfrog a lot of this stuff. 
maybe even get uh, Web2 companies, ex- incumbents, governments really on board on this vision. Because as candidly, as we know, technology gets adopted. If it's faster, it's better and it's cheaper. And, and I think when there's no infrastructure in place uh, and you can credibly come in here and say, look, we're going to stimulate con- consumption, demand. We're going to offer all these different services. It's a difficult geography at times. So maybe if you just have wireless rollout like Helium, then you know all of this stuff kind of actually makes sense. And, and it's not the fluffy, like, let's just bank the unbanked, which that narrative is just like beaten to the drum. But there's not a lot of substance behind it, I think, yet. But I think we're likely going to see it in a place like Africa and probably from some like you guys. So I think it's really exciting what you guys are building. Um, and, and a testament to that is I think the kind of investors that you've you've gotten into the round, which a lot of them uh, certainly is like my first real, real kind of conviction bet on, on the continent, because I hadn't really found local operators that were really kind of uh, focused on that. But um I'm curious if you could just comment on that, because I think it's pretty impressive, um, the kind of people that have gone behind this mission um, and backed you guys. No, 100%. Yeah, you know, I definitely want to go to that. I'm super proud you know, of the team and everyone that's of our backers and their vision for Africa. But I also just want to touch up real quick on the point that you brought up, because I think it's such an underrated concept that when you have incum- incumbents, when you have infrastructure already set up, leafrogging is really hard. But when you don't have all that, you can leafrog. Like going to back why I think when you said, for example, how Tencent, et cetera, is set up in China, that's how people envision it for the U.S., but there is no such crazy tech unicorn all-encompassing like what Tencent has done for China come up in the U.S. as fast in the last decade. I think it's just because of the U.S. is super strong in the first wave of Web2. Like you look at the first wave of Web2 in China, Baidu, Sina, et cetera, they're like, their volumes are uh, super low right now. They're almost, you know, GG. But like you look at the second wave, that's how fast it came up. Tencent, Alibaba, PDD. Um, JD, et cetera, because they could leapfrog that. And they had thousand people, army teams on the ground of how they, you know, sort of swept through uh, China and did the BD in that way. But you look at the US, you know, the first waves are super strong, like Amazon, Google, et cetera, which I think the second wave came up a bit slower, but obviously there's still crazy tech unicorns. Then you look at, you know, the rest of sort of uh, the emerging markets, you know, Southeast Asia, you know, Toko, Grab, Gojek, Bukaloka, you know, Latam, you got Rappi, New Bank, D Local. Africa, there, I don't think there are, there's, there's, um, I'd say there's unicorns, but not at the capacity and the scale that, that there is currently in China and other emerging sort of markets. So, I, you know, that's a super good point. And that's sort of like how we're looking at Africa. I think why so many Chinese companies have found it so successful going to Africa in the last half a decade is because they use the same model of how a lot of the tech unicorns made it so quickly in China to go into Africa. So, like, literally, we call it the thousand people army model, where you have a general managing 10, you know, sub manager of generals, then they manage like 50 to 100 people themselves. So that's sort of maybe how Alice and I, you know, envision it. Because if we just thought about data, that's already a huge business in itself, right? We would have just stopped there. If we thought about just working with the social and Web2 apps, we might have stopped there. If we just thought about play to earn and use that value proposition, we just stopped there. But maybe it's because I spend like 10 to 12 hours every day, you know, on an app called WeChat, you know, Tencent. And I see sort of my whole life, you know, sucked up in there. It's a one-stop shop and how powerful a super app can be which is why we're doing that. Because no one really sets out to do a super app. Like you set out to do something really well. You hit a critical mass of users, and then you can introduce other products and tools into it, which is you know why we set out also our first go-to-market strategy is play to earn, but our end goal is a super app like WeChat. I think uh, that's one of the most amazing parts about finding an emerging market and sort of uh, the users over there introducing them to Web3. Do you guys see Jumbo having more success with the informal sector or the formal sector, or in your opinion, it doesn't really matter. For us, of what we're trying to accomplish in Africa, of a super app, you know, that is a one-stop shop ecosystem for the end user. I think we touch every sector, um, and the sectors we touch is like, like I said, it's not comp- competing with anyone else because you know, um, we're at the end of the day, we're not you know trying to help them save money on remittance and things like that. We're I think providing something that's not there right now. Um, and at the end of the day, no matter how many companies come in and try to disrupt Africa through Web three, that's great for everyone because you're educating and the more education there is the fastest the growth there will be so hopefully in five years you know we see hundreds of companies etc in the same region uh, tackling every sector I'm, I'm assuming you were talking to like the big venture arms and some of the big telcos it sounds like you got some some major major players over there investing in the round when you are explaining to them why you're building on on web3 rails and on crypto rails and what is the reasoning for building on crypto rails instead of just going and trying to build like a super app on on web2 rails I think anyone that's listening to this podcast, honestly, you know, is 
a, has taken a red pill as a true believer, you know, Web3, crypto, et cetera. So I'm not going to go through every one of these aspects, but the advantages of building, you know, this uh, other than uh, from your incumbents and from the legacy players that have been there for decades um, that are really slow to act and everything, because being slow, speed is really a thing in Africa. It's really slow to do anything in Web2 or Web1, um, especially working with them, which is around a roadmap wise, Q2, Q3 is when a lot of these products come out because literally integration, technically speaking, takes a long time. So we want to work with us as much as possible in, in this regard. You look at, obviously, you know, in crypto today, uh, layer ones, you know, there's still a lot of issues, right? No matter if it's EVM compatible, uh, what just happened with Solana, et cetera. But in, in my mind, if this is the future, which it is, then you have to build here and you have to be introducing this. And it's, then it's just an education process too. And honestly, it wasn't even a crazy conversation with any of our partners there. I think one, the trust is there. It's not, it's not like I went to a lot of these guys and it's like, hey guys, I'm James, this is Jumbo. Let's disrupt Africa through Web3. Um, this is the amazing parts about crypto. It's the trust has been there. We've done things together, you know, whether that be through our, with our family, et cetera, in the you know, past few decades, investing in local infrastructure, et cetera. Um, so it's a pitch to them about, and they've heard about a lot of stuff happening in Web3. They just don't know how to enter. It's just like I said, they don't know how to enter a lot of these giants that monopolize the area. And the average user doesn't know how to enter, you know, so everyone just needs a chance. Um, I, I, so that's, I'm not saying, you know, we, we're the God, you know, present, preventing, uh, giving a chance to everyone. But like, I think the way we can work together really would um, sort of bring everyone and, you know, see speed, you know, that we haven't seen that they can do in Web2. Do you, um, similar to China, like China went from being a copycat nation on a manufacturing side of things mm -hmm. to exporting a lot of technology, like, you know, like Xiaomi and, and um, you know, just the way of doing developing like TikTok, for instance, is, you know, a lot of Chinese culture is now being exported to other places. It started with locally now Africa, even in the US, it's permeated now. And I think it's always a very healthy sign of development. Do you ever see Africa exporting technology, um, uh, ways of doing business to other places uh, like Asia or even in the US, like as the continent continues to grow? Uh, is, is, is Jambo ever in a position or other players in Web3 or just generally exporting, um, you know, culture, technology, ways of doing businesses to other places? I think looking at the two as emerging markets and to compare, you know, maybe in 20, 30 years of Africa can be like China. And that's a big statement of where they can start exporting, you know, maybe just to boil down into the intrinsics. Like, I think what the main export of China to the rest of, of the world is hardware, right? In Shenzhen, that's the hardware, you know, capital of China, Beijing, Hangzhou, that's now the software capital. So I think because of China's uniqueness and supply chain, they're able to do that. You know, how fast supply chain is, et cetera. There's companies like PDD that have involved where, you know, it's like Groupon on steroids, um, and et cetera. That's just because of China's supply chain. And I don't think that's possible to be replicated anywhere else in the world. But that's also why, you know, China can start exporting instead of being copycat in many regards. I think for Africa, a lot of, you know, where the uniqueness and maybe the advantages might be the talent, which in the talent, I believe that can be exported. You know, I think we'll see a lot more developers being hired in Africa where we have a strong initiative to hire a sort of locally right now. And I think uh, the world is really undervaluing that the education is getting a lot better, et cetera. So I say talent is the one unique, you know, part in Africa that can be exported versus in China, that's hardware. To anyone listening that wants to get involved um, that is maybe in Africa or not even in Africa, what is, what is the best way to get in touch? What are some of the opportunities that they could work with you guys? Uh, I assume you're hiring a bunch of people locally. Uh, but yeah, what would be kind of some of the ways that people can collaborate with, with Jumbo? Literally in any facet, if you're someone that's looking, that believes in some of the same principles, you know, software engineer, you know, BD operations, et cetera. Or if you're an investor that's trying to come into look at Africa, that can think about how to help your portfolios. If, anywhere in the spectrum, find us, jumbo.technology, um, Twitter, socials, anywhere. We're super open 24 seven with it. You can find our community. So just jumbo technology, our website. And then from there, just find our, uh, anyone on our team. Yeah. Well, I can't, I, you know, I'll, I'll say it publicly. I've said it privately to many people, but this is one of my most exciting, uh, you know, highest conviction bets. I I'm again, I, I think I believe in the region. I've been to Africa multiple times. I've had the good fortune of going to the continent I'm from Latin America. I sort of see a lot of parallels there, but uh, I think what you guys have done is, is impressive in such a short period of time. I'm excited to see where you take this. Um, and, and, you know, I think, um, you know, it, it truly, I think a lot of the criticisms 
to be very upfront is sometimes narratives get pushed to extremes and the unbacked narrative has been a lot of fluff, not a lot of substance to be totally, I, I think in my estimation. And I think what you guys are doing really brings a lot of substance behind a narrative that has a lot of asymmetry, a lot of potential for so many people and can really truly leapfrog um, a lot of non-existing infrastructure in, in a very fragmented region, but one that needs it the most. So congratulations on everything you've done, James. I, I don't know if there's anything else you want to kind of impress on our on our listeners and our viewers, uh, but this has been a great discussion. I, I really, you know, you know, uh, have enjoyed it, uh, but I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to touch on. Uh, likewise, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate Jason, you know, giving me the this uh, opportunity and this platform to sort of voice our opinions and, you know, share a lot of our beliefs. You know, honestly, I think we covered so much in this podcast. Uh, it was super natural. I really didn't think I was going to share so much about my childhood, et cetera. You know, it's, it's interesting podcast. You share, I'm thinking I'm just sharing with Jason and Santiago, but I don't know anyone who's going to be listening to this or if anyone wants to listen to me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, any, if anyone wants to reach out, it's John Ball Technology. Anything else I'll say is really, I hope everyone can um, sort of try to shape and op- give give some leeway to their uh, viewpoints on Africa and really how Web3 can be disrupting it because um, it, it might surprise you. Awesome, James. Well, we're we're, uh, we're rooting for you, man. Uh, exciting to see you guys launch, and uh, yeah, excited to see what uh, what happens with Jambo. Appreciate you, man. Thanks, guys. Jambo, Jambo, Jambo. Take care.